decorative elements out of a journal page makes for interesting viewing both at and through the lace elements to the page underneath. In today's video I'm working with Tracy Scott's lace books that are manufactured in the UK by Leandra and Mark of Paper Artsy. Along with the lace books we've posted new colors of fresco finished paint so get ready to be creative with color and cutouts. When I visited the Paper Artsy booth at Creativation and Creative World, I had an opportunity to see the lace books and Tracy in person. Now, I was pretty excited. I hadn't met her before, but she's a wonderful artist and creative inspiration. If you look at Tracy's samples, you'll see that the, cutout, the lace cutout pages are pretty simply done with color and doodles, and it creates a really nice view through the openings to the page underneath. I kept mine simple. You don't have to. My intent for the lace pages was to use a color that would contrast well with the white Posca paint pen I doodle with. As an aside, those Poscas are on sale at 25% off now, so it's a good time to stock up on those colors and tip sizes you use often. There are all kinds of interruptions of supply chains from art supplies to, good grief, zebra supplies at this point. So with that in mind, I knew that I was going to need to be flexible and that I wasn't going to necessarily use black. Mark and Leander are unable to get some of the colors for fresco finish right now, so I decided to use something dark or dark-ish, and in this case I chose, this is a Tracy color, it's called Peacoat. It contrasts really well with the white. It does what I wanted it to do. So with that in mind, if this is Peacoat and you can see through the openings to what's underneath, let me take this inner signature out and show you the inside. So this is actually a combination of two colors. Interesting accident that happened. I grabbed Byzantium, which is dark enough that I was satisfied that it would be a good background color. But what I didn't do was read the label that says that this is a semi-opaque which, if it takes several thin coats to get an opaque paint like Peacoat to cover to the point that I was satisfied with it, it was really going to take more of Byzantium, which is only semi-opaque. So instead what I did was I brought in Lavender, which is an opaque color, and I put a couple of really thin coats over that. Now what I didn't do was get complete coverage. I didn't want to. I started to realize that I liked the effect of the Byzantium showing through and I was content with this the way that it was so I didn't take it any further. With that said, you can layer colors if you want. There are all different kinds of ways that you can do this. Just remember, whatever color you're planning to doodle with, you need something that will contrast with that. Or conversely, if you end up with a color here that's light, it doesn't mean you can't use a dark color Posca to, to doodle with. I mean, there's all different variations on that theme. So I'm going to grab, bring this, this is the lace cut book number one. I'm going to pull this out of the package. The color that I've selected, sorry, that was noisy. Let me get this out. The color I've selected is named Jade. Dark enough to show or to have the white paint pens show on it really well. It's opaque so I know that I'm going to get reasonably good coverage. Leandra always warns you want to apply thin coats and I keep that in mind. Now one of the things that you'll notice when you open these is that there's a little bit of charring from the laser. If, especially if you're using a light color, just come in and wipe that off. And that way, I mean, uh, something like Peacoat, it was never going to be a factor. But this way, it's gone, and you don't have to worry about it discoloring your lighter color paints. That tends to be mostly on the inside, but I'm going to flip this over, and I'm just going to wipe this front part of this, this lace page. So what I'm going to do is... I'm going to leave this open, but I'm going to just really work on one half of this for now. You don't need to see me do all of this. Now, the thing that I didn't realize the first time I did this, so I laid this on my nonstick craft sheet covered workbench like normal. I'm going to use a mini ink blending tool and a foam. I don't like brush strokes in my work, and this is a good way to avoid them. So I'm going to apply with this. But what I didn't think about it the first time, as I'm going along adding the pea coat, is that I'm essentially working through a stencil. Now, it's a paper stencil but it still acts like a stencil. So the first time I did this, I lifted it up and I had this lovely impression. This is just the, the charring. I had this lovely impression on my nonstick craft sheet that I ended up scraping away. So with that said, what I'm going to do is I'm gonna grab the inner page here just because they're the same size and I'm gonna put this down. Let's grab a little bit of tape and kind of put this in place so that 
I will, for all intents and purposes, stencil this design on the inner signature. Now, I could plan, have planned this a little bit better and had something better ready to work with, but I'm not worried about this for now. We'll just go with it the way that it is. All right, let me put one more piece underneath here. What I don't want is this to shift around. Because my goal is to get paint on the cover, not stencil a perfect design, I need to keep in mind that, and I'm gonna put a little bit more tape on here, just on the side that I'm not gonna worry about right now, just to keep this from shifting. So my goal is to get color on this, not a perfect stencil impression on the piece underneath. So there's going to be some creepage of paint under there. It's not gonna be perfect, but in the next segment, I'll show you how I work around that and how you can kind of repair it. All right, so coming back, jade is an opaque color. I'm gonna give it a little bit of a shake, and then I'm gonna put, now it's gonna take some several light coats so I'm going to put a fair amount of paint out. It's going to take this much to get it done. Again, I don't want to oversaturate my foam here. I want to get it going, and then I want to start. I apply in a circular motion, and you can see that there are, it's streaky here, and that is the nature of the paint. Because I'm putting on really light coats, it's, I'm not going to get perfect coverage on this first coat. I'm well aware of that, and I'm working with that in mind. Now it doesn't matter that I'm not going to continue on to the other part of the page here or the other part of the signature. I can come back and do that after the fact. And because I'm going for opaque coverage, it really won't make any difference. I'll just blend this and smooth this so it looks okay. So this is kind of the process. I'm only going to do the single coat here right now. You don't need to see me do all of this. In fact, you probably don't need to see me do the whole thing. So what I'm going to do is I'll leave the camera running, and um, we'll have Simon, as he edits the video for me, I'll have him cut this off so that you see me kind of get part of this done, but not necessarily the whole thing, because really you don't need to see the whole thing. So up next, I'm going to talk about how I work with the Poskas and doodling and your options for doodling, and I'm going to talk to you about the difference between the PC1M and the PC, whoops, the PC1MR tip sizes because they do affect the lines that you can make with them. For a project like this, the majority of my doodling is done with Posca paint pens. If I were working on a white page, I might bring in something like a pit pen, but for this particular project, I'm sticking with the Poscas. Typically, I'm going to use a PC1M or a PC1MR. That's what these two are here, and I'll show you those tips in a second. But I also will bring in 3Ms and PC5Ms. Both of those are a bullet tip that are larger. As the numbers get bigger, the tip size gets bigger, and they're good for making dots. Now, this was done with a PC1MR. Um, someplace here, I have some others that were done with a 3M. So as you start to work with those bigger bullet tips, you can create bigger dots quite effort effortlessly. So let's talk about the 1M versus the 1MR, and let me show you the difference in the tip sizes. So this is the 1MR. It is the long, skinny pen. This is the 1M, which is essentially the same size tip, more or less. It's shaped a little bit different, but you can see that the barrel is different. So at a glance, it's easy to tell which of these is which. If I take the caps off, and I'm going to put them right here so that you can see them against the black, you can see that there is a very definite difference between these tips. This is a complete fiber tip, and it comes to a tiny little point. This is a tip that's a little bit more blunt, and it's surrounded by a metal ring that supports it. When you make lines with these, this is a PC1MR, and this is a PC1M. And you can see that this tends to be a little bit finer. Now, I could press and get a little bit thicker line. Remember, whoops, that's not what I wanted to do. But um, you can press a little bit harder and get a thicker line, but there's a limit to what you can do with this, whereas this is going to create a different look. So it's easy to get kind of feathery strokes with this. With the, the more blunt tip of the PC1MR, it's easy to get nice, consistent lines. The, the reality is the slower you work with this pen, the better your lines are going to be in terms of them being the same size. Remember, this one I can do flicking to get feathery with, like eyelashes. This is going to produce a nice thin line, but it's going to be darker and it's going to be more consistent. So when I bring in, I'm going to use the 1MR right now. 
when I bring in this particular lace journal, you can see that I've already started to do some of the outlining. Now I tend to put the cap on, I find that it balances the pen a little bit better in my hand. That's entirely up to you. You can emulate what Tracy often does, which is to work around or doodle around, trace around the lace openings in the book. You can dot things, which is kind of what I've done here. There, I don't know what that was, but it kind of didn't belong there. So when it comes to this, Tracy has a tendency, her strokes are a little bit more feathery. It gives a very different look. Mine tend to be a little bit more solid. I would suggest that you play around and work with the pens and then figure out what your particular style is. So if I'm gonna do this, I put my hand down, I put the fatty part of my hand down here, and I use that as a fulcrum, and I twist on that, I pivot on that spot. And I always generally work from left to right because that's I'm right-handed, and that's the way my hand moves naturally. So for me, that's the more natural look. I can do this, but I don't get the same results. So I find the best thing to do is to turn the page and do the exact same thing again. Now obviously you want to be certain that you're not putting your hand in something that's already wet. So I have a tendency, I'll jump around and move from area to area. Now there are places, if you look right here, and if I hold this up, you can see that this is not particularly neat. And then I realized that I could actually trace this in one piece and get a much nicer look. So you'll want to kind of think about those things. I'm still not real satisfied with these diamond shapes. I'm still working out the way that I want to do those. But when it comes time to, to come in here, again, I'm going to work in the way that my hand flows the best. So I'm going to turn that now, and then I'm going to come back this way. I'm actually going to bring this back this way, because I can still pivot my hand on there. And I just want to kind of feather that in. Now, when I make circles, it doesn't seem to be, there doesn't seem to be any way to really feather that overlap. You are going to get a slightly darker spot. That's one of those things that I have learned to live with. Now, because this line overran the edge a little bit, it's going to meet with the circle. But again, perfection is highly overrated, so what I want to do is get these done and not spend a lot of time agonizing over those little tiny details. I like making dots with the 1MR. I find that I can make really consistent dots quite easily with this tip. I also find that I don't want there to be any bounce in what I'm working on. So I'm moving my fingers to keep this top tight against the bottom so that I'm not working on that bounce. And really, that's how simple it is. So with that said, uh, you can see that I've started to do a little bit of work here. I'm going to talk about these dots in a, in, a, in a moment or two. So let's come back to the stencil version that we talked about a moment ago. And the original one that I did is right here. And this is the stencil version of working with Lace Cut Book 2. This is one of the pages in that. So if I grab someplace here. All right, so here's a Lace Cut Book 2. You can see that this is the cutouts here, and that's what this is. So I came through and I did the same thing that you saw me do a moment ago when I put the jade on this cover. And speaking of which, here is the stencil version of that. Now I was not very careful here. What I didn't say is when you are working on this lace stuff, and there's no paint on here, rather than do this because I wasn't thinking about what I was doing and that's what I did, you should try to follow as you're applying the paint Follow these lines, that'll do two things, especially the thin pieces like this. It means that you won't catch them with the ink blending tool, and it also means that you won't be driving paint under them and you'll see less of this. So when I did this one, I actually did a far better job of following the shape of the cutouts as opposed to working against them, and so I got a better result. But no matter what you do, or at least I found no matter what I do, because my goal is to put color on the cover 
and not to make a perfect stenciled image, there is going to be some creepage. There are going to be places where the paint creeps under that lace cutout. So I have discovered that you can camouflage that. Is it perfect? Nope, but that's good enough for me. It doesn't have to be perfect. So this is a PC1MR in black. Again, I'm going to get a more consistently solid line with it. I don't feel like I need to go heavier than this. I could jump in with a 3 if I really wanted a much darker border, black border around all these pieces, but I didn't necessarily feel the need to do that. So again, same process. I'm going to rotate. I'm going to pivot on that kind of that chunky part of the heel of my hand. Just make sure the paint is flowing. Now this is a little bit more of a challenge because there can be a ridge on the paint. Uh, I think I am going to do this straight edge. I was, I was a little bit in doubt about whether I wanted to do that, but I do want to clean that up. So I'm going to be consistent and go all the way around all of the elements on here. So anyway, because there can be a little bit of a ridge of paint, it can be a little bit more of a challenge to be consistent about that because sometimes the tip of the pen hits the ridge. Again, this is, doesn't have to be perfect. It just doesn't. So process is just to go around and doodle around all of these and then because Poskas are permanent when they're dry and because the fresco paint is also permanent when it's dry you can come in and wash something over it. For example, I think it's this one. Is it this one? Mm, it's probably not this one. Maybe it's the other one which of course, here it is. Is this it? Nope, that's not it. Well, what I was going, oh here it is. Good grief. All right, so coming back to this, and I talked about the fact that um, I didn't get the coverage that I was aiming for, yada, yada, yada. But what I did do, and you can see that I've played around with the colors, and let's get this out of the way, or at least let's put the white side down so you've got some contrast. You can see that I gradated the colors. That was very deliberate. I wanted that movement of light to dark. But what you can, yep, you can just see on there a little bit. I came in with, Dilutions shimmer spray, shook the heck out of it, and then put a little bit on my nonstick craft sheet, picked it up with a brush, and washed it over this. Because the Poskas are permanent when they're dry, and because the fresco paint is, is you can add a layer of something over the top without disturbing what's on here. All right, so with all of that said, now let's talk about an alternate to doodling, and that is dotting. Now, I will confess that the whole dot painting thing has kind of rushed past me, and I didn't jump on board, but boy am I glad I took the opportunity to play with this a little bit, because you've got a perfect, you don't have to put lines down, the cutouts are here, and it acts as a guideline for your dots. So up next, I'm going to show you how I do that using, well, this is the package. So this is the Wendy Vecchi Make Art set of stencils that are meant to be used with her station and all of the other gigos and doodads in that line, they make perfect dotting tools. So dots and dot making. This is my first attempt at making patterns with dots, but really it's such an easy process that despite my lack of experience, they don't look awful. I'm using the two styluses I showed you a moment ago. So these are the two that come in Wendy's set and when you look at them you'll see that there are four different tip sizes in here which means it's four very easy dot sizes. So the simplest option for making dots is what I think of as dip dot dip where you dip the stylus in paint, make a dot, and then go back and dip into paint again before making another one and that keeps the dots roughly the same size. Let's slip those out of the way. So this is just one of the black 3x4 smooth and sturdy disc bound pages. Now I, these are not perfectly round because I was trying hard to make bigger dots so that you could see them. So what I'm going to do is I'll use this one to make some more dots and then I'll come in with one of the small ones. I want to show you that you can layer colors one on top of the other. And I'm only going to do two here now, but if you have tools that make bigger dots, you can make progressively smaller ones on top of it and create this whole range of colors that stack one on top of the other. For this, I'm just going to use a light color so that it shows against the background here and hopefully it'll show up against the purple color that's there. So I'm going to put just a little tiny bit out. Obviously, I'm going to use next to nothing here. You can work from the cap if you want. I, I find it's a little bit easier to just work from the table. So I'm going to use the big one just to show you the process and then I'll switch to the, a different size to get another one stacked up on here. So you would think that you might want to come in this way, but I find if I hold this like a pencil, I get better results. So it's just dip, 
and dot. Now I'm eyeballing not only the distance between them, but desperately trying to make a straight line, which I can see is not really happening, but you understand where I'm going. Now you can see as I start to run out of paint here, my dots are starting to get just the tiniest bit smaller. Well, that's because I'm actually loading less onto the stylus tip each time. So if I were doing more of this, I would put a larger puddle of paint out. I'm just going to scoop a little bit to try to get a normal size or a normal load on there so that my dots remain a little bit more consistent. Now there is something that you can do where you don't reload in between and that's going to give you progressively smaller dots. Again, not a straight line. Good grief. But you can see, despite the size of this tip, I can get some pretty small dots when in fact I go ahead and allow that paint to run out. So I'm going to pick up, this is the white tool and it's the larger of the stylus ends and again I'm going to scoop because there's not a ton of color left here. Let's turn this this way so I don't get my hands into it. And it's just a simple matter of putting another dot on top of the one that's already there and suddenly you've created this whole layered dimensional effect. So that's dots. I Trust me, I'm having a good enough time with this that I can promise you that there'll be a future video about dots and dot making. I just wanted to show you that little bit for now. And so then the last thing I want to show you is how I go about putting, or a technique, for putting colors on the background. This is my version of Leandra's brayering technique. I do apply the paint a little bit heavier than she does, but with that said, as long as you don't glop it on, this stuff dries very quickly. So even though I might put two colors together, like what is essentially a purpley pink and green, because they dry, they're gonna layer and they're not gonna mix. So I'm only gonna do half of this. So let's kind of wipe the debris off and I have four colors. Now again, keep in mind that there are shortages of some colors. If you can't get the exact same ones I'm using here, it doesn't make any difference. Find something close. Remember, you're letting the layers dry. They're not going to blend. So I have Cerulean, Niagara Falls, Moonlight, and Slime. These three are opaque. This is semi-opaque, so I can expect a little bit less coverage with this. I'm actually not going to really pay that much attention right now. I'm going to, let's start with Niagara Falls. Again, I'm going to give this a little bit of a shake. I'm going to put some color out. Now, I'm not going to do the whole thing, or maybe I will. It depends on how much paint I put out. Well, that was a ton, way more paint than what I needed. So let's pick some of that up with my finger and put some of it back, because I don't need this much for this page. At least I don't think I do. In terms of the brayer, this is the one in the line from Ranger that is the gel printing plate stuff that's marketed under Dina and Diane's names. So here's what I do one way or the other, but at 90 degree angles. I don't go across on a diagonal. This works better for me. Um, Leander finds that it works better for her. I think you get better results this way. So I'm not going to come in and press too hard this time because I've got a full load of paint on there, but I am going to go ahead and brayer this on in various places. And I want to use up, ideally I'm going to use up all of this paint, but again, that was too much paint, so that's not going to work. So what I'll do is grab a paper towel and just brayer the excess off and then pick this up. Now this is getting dry already and I'm going to come in with a color that is not going to be problematic. I'll come back and use the Moonlight last. So the other three, the Slime, the Cerulean, and the Niagara, uh, excuse me, Niagara Falls, which is here, are going to work. I'm not going to get mud no matter what I do. So next I'm going to bring in some of the Slimed. Just put a little bit down certainly less than the last time. This is the, and what I didn't say is, is of the two brayers in that line that Dina and Diane use, this is the smaller of the two. I like this regardless of the surface that I'm working on. All right, so I can press a little bit harder here as I use up most of that paint. Nothing says you can't leave a little bit of white space, so don't feel compelled to get rid of it all. There's nothing wrong with white space. All right, so let's put a little teeny bit of the cerulean out. And 
And what I try to do is vary how much of the color I put on so that all of my patterning doesn't look the same. I mean, ultimately it is all the same, but I don't want them to it all appear identical. So that's kind of my process. Again, I'm going to wipe this off. Ordinarily, this is not what I would do, but I would brayer this off on something else. It's not happening today. So I think that this looks a little bit thin. So rather than just bringing in the moonlight, which is going to be fine, I'm going to bring in a little bit. This is lilac. So I'm going to bring in a little bit of this too. Go ahead and give it a shake. Now the green is dry enough. I'm not worried about it blending with either of the two purpley colors. That's probably enough of that. And then this is probably close enough that I'm going to have to pick something else, but that's all right. We will be nimble and figure this out. Yeah, see, I like that better. All right, so then it's just a matter of, I think I need something that's got a little bit of a kick to it. I don't exactly know what that's going to be yet. Maybe we'll bring in a little bit of, actually, you know what, I've got this little bit of coral here. I'm going to avoid the purple so that I don't blend it by accident. And I'm just going to put this on kind of as an accent color. Just a little teeny bit here or there. Yep, see that does it. I kind of like the way that looks. It adds a little bit of a kick without overwhelming anything. And as far as I'm concerned, this is done. Um, you can add more, certainly. Um, let me wipe this up for one second. If I open this up, you can see that my coverage was heavier here, and here I came in and I took, this is one of Elizabeth St. Hilaire's masks, don't ask me the name because I can't remember, and I put paint on it, and then I pressed it down because my plan is for this, let me think about what I'm doing, yes, for this, nope, wrong one, this one, for this to go like this. So where I've got the larger openings here, I know that I want bigger openings to see through. Excuse me, I said that back. So where I have the larger openings, I know that I can have a busier background. It's going to work that way. Whereas when I come over here, this is much busier. The lace cutouts and all of the line work around it are much busier. And so I wanted something a little, a little bit less busy underneath. So then the last thing that I want to mention is when you start nesting signatures together. So when I put this together, you can see that this lines up pretty well, although the signature is just poking out a little bit. This is what I call creepage. You can't help it. Even when you start with two pages that are identical in size, by nesting them one inside the other, you're always going to get this little bit of creepage. So I take and I trim this off. I like the look better when these pages are more even. So I, would, I might come back and trim this one just a little bit more. I probably wasn't super even up here, but this is my preference when I do this. So Tracy Scott's lace booklets, they're pretty bloody fabulous, and I think that they open the door to all kinds of creative possibilities.